Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 61 of the Ask Historians podcast. So today our topic is ostensibly the Battle of Nemea, which is a late 4th century BC battle between uh, a Spartan coalition and essentially the rest of Greece, uh, and was the largest hoplite battle on record. But just to warn you, we're not really going to actually get to the the battle itself until about 20 minutes into this conversation, because uh, before that, we're going to spend that kind of intro period talking a lot about, well, Greek hoplite warfare, ancient Greek warfare in general, just kind of talking about the way it worked, uh, a lot of kind of the misconceptions that people might have, uh, how the kind of academic historiography of uh, interpreting Greek warfare has evolved over the years and and kind of some of the controversies that exist currently about interpreting some of these past sources and just how we can really, we as people in the modern day can look back to this past period, you know, more than 2000 years ago and try to suss out from the very, you know, rare sources that we have and from our archaeological evidence about how it worked. So it's, it's a great uh, episode. And in fact, I really hope that we can get uh, our guest today back on. So if, if you enjoyed this episode, please let me know uh, so that way I can kind of pressure him to come back because uh, I would say this is probably the, of all the episodes I usually have when I'm going through editing, I have at least a few questions that pop up. And you'll notice if you go into the discussion post that I'm usually the first one, like immediately after I post uh, the discussion posts uh, for everyone to ask questions, I'm usually the first one to come along and say, so I was thinking about something that I was heard on the episode as I was editing through it. Uh, So I'm usually the first person to ask a question. And this episode left me with so many questions. So if you go into the discussion post, you'll see all of those that I had, and hopefully maybe some of you will have the same questions and we can get our guests to kind of address those. But again, uh, he's a wonderful guest, and I'm sure if I had let him speak even longer, he would have gone on. Uh, we'd probably still be talking right now. But we kept it short and uh, concise, at least <laughs> as short and concise as Ask a Sarin's podcast episodes go. Um, before we get actually get into the episode, I have uh, two announcements. Uh, the first one is that we are now on Google Play. Uh, So uh, Google Play uh, has kind of been opening up to podcasts. So we are now on Google Play. I am a terrible host, so I don't have the URL you can go to to read off on air. I'll have that next episode, but I'll put it up in the discussion post so you can click on that. And if you want to listen to the podcast through Google Play, you can do that. Uh, The second and I'm, I'm sure more important announcement that most of you are waiting for is I'm announcing the winner of our very first inaugural Ask Historians book giveaway. So for those of you who don't know, or those of you who just need a refresher, uh, if you are a contributor to our Patreon account, which is uh, patreon.com forward slash askhistorians, I'm at least that good of a host of this. Uh, If you contribute $1 a month, you get your name placed into a raffle. Uh, And if you contribute $5 a month, you get two tickets. If you contribute $3, sorry, $10 a month, you get three tickets in there. And if you contribute more than $10 a month, you get, I guess, the, the warm feeling of having lots of money to spend on frivolous things. You know, there are orphans out there who could use that money, right? So the point is, is that uh, if you are a contributor or Ask a Historian's Patreon account, that you are uh, part of this raffle. Uh, So uh, just to remind you that what we're going to do is as uh, we kind of accrue money, and a lot of you contributed uh, recently, uh, kind of bumping up our numbers. So I'll have to kind of reassess how frequently we're going to have to do this. But if you're a contributor to the Patreon uh, you, you're part of this raffle, and so just to remind you that our books for this raffle, uh, these books are kind of offered up suggestions by our flared users, uh, are for this round. It is Matthew Restall's Seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest. That was actually my <laughs> suggestion, exercising a bit of a host prerogative there. Uh, Hans von V's Greek Warfare Myths and Realities actually came from our guest today. John Hagedorn's The Insane Chicago Way, The Daring Plan by Chicago Gangs to Create a Spanish Mafia, and Herbert Butterfield's, and this is a classic, The Whig Interpretation of History. So uh, I've already drawn out the name. I was going to do kind of a dramatic rustling of papers and things like that, but I've already drawn out the name. Uh, and the winner of the very first inaugural Ask Historians podcast book giveaway is Bill R., so, Bill, I will be sending you an email to the email that you have registered on Patreon, and we can figure out how I will get this book to you. And for those of you who did not win this time around, uh, don't worry. I think we're going to be doing this a lot more frequently than I originally planned. Uh, so thank you for your very, 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 very generous support. And uh, with all that out of the way, uh, let's get to the episode. It's a good one. Welcome to the 
Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today, I'm here with Iphicrates, uh, or as he's better known to uh, people outside the Ask Historians subreddit, uh, Rule. And we'll be talking about the Battle of Nemea today, but also kind of generally uh, Greek warfare and hoplites and hoplite tactics and more and more and more hoplites. Uh, but before we get started, uh, Rule, why don't you give us an idea about what got you interested in this topic? So I actually went out studying history when I went to university because I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I'd always been interested in basically any kind of aspect of history. I didn't originally have any field in mind I wanted to specialize in um, until in my second year, I did a subject on uh, Greek warfare. And I thought I was playing a lot of Rome Total War at the time, which is how a lot of people get into this. <laughs> Um, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if I could like be an expert on this and find out how this actually worked instead of just sort of playing the game and, and seeing how other people have tried to render it. Um, and that's when it started and it was sort of like a gateway drug and I, I never looked back. I did my BA thesis and then I did my MA and then I did a PhD and I'm now a researcher and I'm still, um, still studying Greek warfare. Well, we're happy to have you here, Dr. Rule. But uh, I think most people would have... You know, because like you say, most people encounter, you know, this Greek warfare through a lot of kind of popular media. And I, I think perhaps that gives a kind of a, a, an idealized view of, of how these battles actually work. Because, I mean, if you were to ask me, you know, how does Greek hoplite warfare work? I would say, well, one city state says to another city state, hey, let's fight. They come to an agreed upon place, which is a broad, open, flat field. Two lines of guys that don't waver from that line. Um, walk slowly towards each other and then shove for a few hours and then they both go home. So I think you are probably cringing in horror right now. So what am I getting wrong here? Um, uh, just a few everything. Um, the thing is, like, there's a lot of established tradition about what Greek warfare is supposed to be like. And this still really dominates popular culture. So when you pick up any textbook on this or when you do a little bit of casual learning about Greek history, you'll probably find this exact story retold. Um, it is, however, based on very little evidence, mostly from extrapolating from a couple of very short passages and saying this applied to all of Greek history. What's actually going on is that the Greeks, obviously, they're not crazy. They are trying to win when they when they go out to war. Um, they're trying to make sure that they can do maximum damage to the enemy and minimal damage to themselves, which is generally the rationale that you have when you go into battle, as far as I understand it. So. They're not going to go and prearrange the place where they fight, and they're not going to try and make it as fair as possible, which this this model also suggests. And they're not going to try and exclude uh, non-heavy infantry from the battle line and trying to make sure that it is as fair and open and honest as possible. Um, they're going to try and find ways to get an advantage so that they can win. And that's very much what we actually see in classical Greek history. And so in doing my little bit of background research on this, it seemed like there was kind of a shift between um, this kind of older archaic period and this kind of classic period uh, style of warfare. And I guess uh, just for the listeners, if you could kind of define what time period we're actually talking about as well. Yeah, so what we're talking about here is the distinction between the archaic period, which is roughly the 8th to the 6th century BC, and then the classical period, which is the 5th and 4th centuries BC. I am an expert mostly on the classical period, but a lot of people have been saying like, oh, there's a big sort of tradition of Greek warfare that develops during the archaic period, and this sort of still applies in the classical period. A lot of recent scholarship has basically said that that's not true, and the intricate problem here is the problem of sources. We have sources for classical warfare, we practically don't have sources for archaic warfare. And so what's been happening is that a lot of people have taken the classical stuff and projected it back into the archaic period, and sort of arguing that it would become simpler and simpler as you go further and further back, and so sort of retroactively imposing this model upon history. But the truth is that we don't know that much about archaic warfare, and it's only when, in the classical period, when we get historical accounts, that we really get a view of what Greek warfare was actually like. And by that time, it's already no longer, according to the orthodox view, is no longer, or it is already, um, quite sophisticated, and it's drifting away from this very simple image that, that people tell us was, was in play in the archaic period. So, I mean, do we have classical sources writing about the past? I mean, is because, is, you know, you said we don't really have sources for archaic warfare, but, I mean, do we have classical sources writing about archaic warfare? And it, could that be perhaps skewing our view of how things worked? 
There's actually very little of that. I mean, most of the idea that Greek warfare was once very limited is based on one passage from Herodotus in which a Persian, who's obviously not a very reliable source on this, describes what the Greeks, what Greek warfare was like. And he says, oh, they, they're really stupid because all they do is they just get together on this prearranged place on the flattest possible land and they just smash into each other and everyone dies, basically. They could have done so much more sophisticated stuff, but they just don't. They're stupid. Um, and people have said, look, this is, you know, this is a source that supposedly speaks to the early 5th century BC, so the beginning of the classical period. He's referring to a tradition that existed before that time, so he must be talking about how the Greeks fought during the archaic period. But the problem is that Herodotus himself describes a fair bit of archaic history, or at least late archaic Greek warfare, and it's nothing like that. They constantly trick each other, they're ambushing each other, they're besieging each other. They're never ever fighting in this sort of pre-arranged and fair and open form of warfare, with one exception, and that is the only case for, which is the famous Battle of the Champions. And this is supposed to have happened in the middle of the 6th century BC, when the Spartans and the Argives agreed to each send 300 men to fight one battle, and to see what the outcome of that would be. But the interesting thing is that what happens then is that they can't agree over who won uh, because there are two guys left on one side. And so they go home and say, look, there's more of us. We, we won. There's one guy left on the other side and says, oh, everybody's gone. I won. And so they both they dispute who won this battle. They bring their whole armies to it to try and settle the business and they end up fighting in all that battle. So this idea, this attempt to try and limit warfare is a complete failure. And it's the only example we have. This, this dearth of sources, this kind of textual black hole when you come to the archaic and we've kind of filled it in with our ideals or mm. kind of our preconceptions about how the warfare should have worked. That's right. And it's mostly due to that one source that I mentioned from Herodotus, that, that one Persian who basically seems to describe Greek warfare in this way. Um, and people have just said like, oh, we've extrapolated that throughout that whole period. That's just how the, I agree, uh, the Greeks ideally wished to fight. But the problem is that that, that, Greek sword, that Persian source is just completely unreliable. I mean, he is in the context of the text. He's trying to persuade Xerxes, the great king, to invade Greece. And so obviously he's trying to make it seem like it's going to be easy. So he's trying to portray these Greeks as saying like, oh, they're, they're really daft. They just come out and, and fight you in the open, which is exactly what Xerxes wants, because that's what his armies are made for. That's what he's got the bigger army. He's got the better army. So he's going to beat the Greeks if they do that. So Mardonius, the Greek, the Persian advisor, is trying to persuade Xerxes that the Greeks fight their wars in a very stupid way. But they actually don't. And nothing in Herodotus suggests that they do. Well, let, let's talk about the Greeks not fighting in stupid ways. So our really, you know, idealized version of Greek warfare is is hoplites. You know, these phalanxes or phalanges. What is the proper term there? <laughs> phalanxes. You can use either, actually. <laughs> okay. Mixing a little bit of biology in there. So these phalanxes, <laughs> you know, they, they have heavy hoplites go out. They may not be as rigid as we think. But, you know, when do we really see this this kind of maturation of this system of hoplite-centric warfare? So this is actually kind of a controversial question. There are those who like to argue, like we first see the equipment appearing in the early, in the sort of early, late 8th to the early 7th century BC. The first time we see the equipment that we associate with hoplites. And so people have said, you know, this equipment shows that the new tactics have arrived. From the early 7th century BC, you have hoplite phalanxes going at it. But the problem is that there's very little or practically no evidence that this is actually what's going on. Like depictions of battles in that time are very sort of mixed fighting, a lot of dueling. There's a lot of like archers mixing in with the hoplites. There is light troops mixing in cavalry running about the battlefield. Um, actual descriptions of warfare, such as the poetry of Tertius, explains that there are light armed troops mixing in with the heavy, heavy infantry and the heavy infantry is encouraged to go ahead of its own line and fight it out with the, with the enemy front rank fighters. So there's a lot more sort of fluidity and mixed kind of mixed fighting going on. It's not until the first descriptions of actual historical battles, which again happen at the beginning of the classical period, that we actually see a phalanx in action. And there's an interesting linguistic side to this, which is that the, the word hoplite, which we associate sort of universally with this equipment, this very heavy big round shield and the famous Corinthian helmet and this heavy armor and the spear, we associate that so much with that type of warrior that we assume that this is simply the name of the new warrior that appears early on in the 7th century BC. But the truth is that the Greeks don't use this word at all until the 5th century. So there is no such thing as a hoplite until the classical period. It just that that name doesn't exist. These heavy infantrymen are called eikmetai or dorophoroi, they're spear carriers, basically spearmen. Or at best they're called panoploi, which is like the men who are fully equipped. Um, the word hoplite doesn't exist until the 470s. 
And the word phalanx is even weirder. I mean, it exists in Homer, but is not used in the singular in a tactical sense until Xenophon in the 4th century BC. So this idea of like hoplite phalanx is going at it, it's a classical concept. It doesn't exist before that time. And so really what we're talking about kind of before the, the, the 4th century, 5th century kind of uh, BC at this point is really more of kind of uh, heavily armed men who we would later call hoplites, but they're, they're mixed in with light infantry as well. Uh, perhaps slingers, archers, it's kind of more of a, it's less of that kind of pure linked shield line of hoplites than everybody else kind of off to the side. Yeah, it's very much more it's a, a matter of like you, you come as you are, like you go to battle with the equipment that you can afford. So the rich, the very few rich men um, are fully equipped in heavy armor and they go sort of to battlefield in small groups. But most of the, their dependents, most of the people that they draft in to come with them are basically lightly armed. Um, they wear no armor. They fight as light or missile troops. Some of them just come unarmed and throw rocks at the enemy. That's really all they can afford to do. And it's not until the very end of the archaic period, very end of the 6th century, that Greek states get to the point where they can field large numbers of hoplites, and that's when warfare changes. So really what we'd have is we'd have one rich man with his very fancy armor, and then all his kind of, you know, his, his, his troop of people uh, who may be less, uh, less heavily equipped, and they would be kind of centered around him if, you know, this is the way I'm kind of envisioning it then. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly the picture we get from when you're reading Homer, like when you're reading the Iliad, but also when you're reading Tritaeus. There are a few heavily armed troops, and they're surrounded by a mass of light armed troops. Yeah, so and it's like it's a nucleus of a, of a pre-hoplite and then everyone else around him. Pretty much. And, you know, it's probably right to say that throughout the archaic period, the number of heavy infantry is increasing, but there are still re- relatively small bands towards the end of the archaic period. That's, that's when it finally really starts to change. Yeah, so we've kind of established a time period when that shifts. But, I mean, you mentioned that it, this really kind of comes about because the, the Greek city-states are being able to afford, right, to... Um, have more heavy infantry out there is that because there are richer people or is there more of a kind of a state investment in warfare what is what is that causes the shift you know none of this is, has to do anything to do with state finances which are still very very primitive in this period i mean they exist but if they exist they are mostly to do with trying to raise a navy or cavalry so the infantry just has its own equipment so the idea is that towards the end of the sixth century and this is very archaeologically attested you suddenly see a shift from large estates worked by just wage labor to a sort of fragmentation into small what they call family farms or middle class farms some people would like to argue and Hansen is very much the man on this so you see a fragmentation into a wider class of people who can afford some basic uh, military equipment even though they are not necessarily rich enough to count among the sort of upper classes that previously dominate society and these are the people who then give the city-state levy the numbers to make an actual hoplite formation. So essentially we've gone from a few very heavily equipped rich men to you know, this kind of uh, idealized gentleman farmer middle class who is now able to afford um, enough of this heavy armor to kind of form these masses of hoplites. Well, I do want to qualify that a little bit because the idea of a middle class is really imposed upon ancient Greece. They really didn't have much of a concept of a middle class and there wasn't a middle class as such. There's just a greater um, section of the population that has its own property and that can afford the armor. And even so, like we're still talking about maybe an upper 15 to 30 percent of the population. So the majority is still too poor to to be able to afford anything like this. But nevertheless, I mean, their numbers are at least increasing to the point where you can start thinking about heavy infantry formations rather than just clumps of heavy infantry, bands of warriors, you know, the small scale warfare that we see in the archaic period. Now, you had mentioned that you know, if the state was going to be investing in things military, uh, that it'd usually be uh, navies or cavalry. And I, I don't think we're going to get too much into navies here because we're going to be talking about a land battle. Uh, and it'd be very unusual if a ship showed up. But it, it does seem like with our view of hoplites, hoplites, and more hoplites, that we kind of tend to gloss over the fact that, yes, there, there, I mean, there was cavalry on the field. There was you know slingers and archers. But you know, these tend to get, uh, these tend to just kind of vanish when we start talking about the battle. So, you know, what was, what was the role of these auxiliaries, if they were in fact considered auxiliaries, uh, at warfare in this kind of classical style? So actually the auxiliaries were extremely important and I, I would almost not like to call them auxiliaries. I mean, they were very much a part of an integrated system. The idea is that in the archaic period you have mixed forces. So you have the light infantry moving in between the heavy infantry seeking shelter with among them and you don't really have organized formations. 
Now, towards the classical period, as these hoplites become more numerous, they expel the light troops and the cavalry from their formation, and they start forming a homogeneous heavy infantry unit. And, and almost immediately, you get these units of cavalry and light infantry that start to find their own roles in pitch battles that occur in the early classical period. And the, this sort of very soon is develops into a quite sophisticated concept of combined arms tactics, in which each separate arm is recognized to have certain strengths and weaknesses, and they're used to complement each other. And this is true as for hoplites just as much as it is for other troops. Like we tend to see this whole Greek warfare as being all about hoplites, 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 but actually hoplites were extremely vulnerable to light arm troops when they were marching or when they were caught in open ground. They were even more vulnerable to cavalry, which was really very, very powerful, both tactically and strategically in terms of their ability to um, to dominate open terrain. And so hoplites needed protection against these other troops, which they sought very often in trying to arrange the conditions of battle to make it to exclude others. And they didn't do this necessarily as a rule or as a moral imperative, but simply as a practical arrangement to make sure that the hoplite phalanx would not be too vulnerable to being outflanked or to being overtaken or to being attacked in the rear. So what they would do, they would try to deploy in narrow spaces, they would try to deploy in with their flanks backed on rivers or mountains or hillsides or walls to make sure that nobody could get around them. And that almost automatically reduced the battle to a clash of phalanxes. But this is not the result of these phalanxes being the only important part of the battle. This is the result of the Greeks being very well aware that a hoplite phalanx is extremely vulnerable unless you create the right conditions for him, and then they can flourish. What was it that made these phalanxes so vulnerable to cavalry? Was it the fact that you know, cavalry could easily outflank them, or you know, was it the fact that uh, you know the vulnerability to archers was it sort of more of kind of a this issue of that if you have this kind of forward-facing formation that you end up having a bit of uh, I guess weakness on your on your flanks and from the rear. Yeah, so it, I mean, it's all about the fact that the hoplite is the slowest and the least versatile of the of the different unit types that are available because all he can do is charge and engage in hand to hand combat. And so, if you can keep yourself at a distance from him, if you can keep out of the reach of his spear, then you're basically untouchable. So, light infantry and cavalry both had the advantage that they just couldn't be caught by hoplites. They just could always remain out of range and just keep throwing missiles at him, keep firing arrows at him, even just throwing rocks to gradually wear him down. But cavalry also had the advantage that anybody who was caught out of a formation could just simply be ridden down. I mean, cavalry wasn't simply a missile platform. It also served to um, carry out shock charges or to pursue enemies that had been scattered. So, hoplite phalanx is very often had to be very careful to maintain their formation and to keep very close together because as soon as they were even a little bit scattered, uh, cavalry, just they were just prey for cavalry. They were absolutely no challenge to overcome. And so the hoplite phalanx is simultaneously the best way to use a group of hoplites and also the only way to use them if you want to prevent them falling prey to enemy cavalry. Yeah, now you had said that the, the hoplite itself was somewhat slow, I guess you could say. Um, is that because of all this heavy armor that they're wearing? Because you know, I've 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 heard um, or I've read uh, estimates that they might be wearing something like fifty to almost like eighty pounds of armor uh, when they when they get into the hoplite marching formation. Well, there's a bit of a question about how much armor they would actually wear. I mean, there's definitely um, a trend for them to lighten their armor increasingly. So in the archaic period, when they're fighting more alone, more by themselves in a sort of storm of missiles that's going on. Um, they wear very heavy armor. They wear bronze all over them and they have fancy things like thigh pieces and shoulder pieces and ankle pieces and all sorts of like bronze all over. Um, but if you could afford it, of course. But towards the classical period, as they sort of start to move into an actual organized formation, um, they get to ditch a lot of that. So their body armor, like these bronze cuirasses, they mostly disappear. The heavy Corinthian helmet that we associate so much with Greek hoplites, um, it kind of goes out of fashion. Nobody really uses it anymore. They use more open helmets that are lighter. It's still offer protection. And so they wear less and less armor. But even so, the main thing that makes a hoplite a hoplite is his massive um, double grip shield, which is this very big round shield called an aspis. And this in itself, I mean, at least it weighs like six pounds, at most probably twice that, um, especially if it's got bronze plating on the outside. And that is in itself such a heavy piece of equipment that it would be impossible for a hoplite running, trying to pursue, to catch up with someone who isn't carrying one. And that's that's the simple truth of it. And do we have 
I mean, surviving uh, examples or artifacts of, you know, from this time period that we can look at and say, oh, here, you know, here is a, a classic era Aspis. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There is, I mean, the best example of this, actually, there are a couple of ones that we find that unfortunately have mostly decayed because they're made of wood. I mean, they're just inter interwoven lattice work. So the wood decays and disappears, but some of them, will, they will preserve the bronze rim and the grip on the outside, on the inside. Um, but there is one very nice example, which was found in Athens, which was actually captured from the Spartans in 425 BC. And though that shield actually has an inscription on it saying when it was captured and by whom, um, which, which shows us exactly what these shields would have looked like. And that one is, is a complete bronze facing. So we know that they, it would have covered a wooden shield completely. So, you know, before we move into the actual battle itself, and I know we're kind of doing a lot of kind of pre-work here, but I, I think it will help us understand when we actually start talking about the Battle of Nemea. But the, the other thing is that, you know, we tend to think of these hoplites in these very, very deep ranks. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not just, you know, three or four men in a, you know, uh, three or four men deep in a line. It's, you know, eight to 20 or something like that. I mean, what, what was the, what I hear is, of course, that uh, this was to help, you know, push the men forward. Uh, but it, what do we really know about what the cause or the reason for these deep ranks were? So the theory about the pushing is really, is, is quite controversial. I mean, there is a term for this in Greek, the othismos, which suggests that there is a phase in battle in which everybody's pushing each other forward and the winning side literally shoves the enemy off the field. But this is quite controversial because the othismos or pushing might well be a metaphorical term in the sense that we now use a military push as well. The thing is that there is, as, as phalanxes develop, so from the early classical period onward, you gradually get a sense that the Greeks start to think about how deep a phalanx should be. And it's actually not until 426 that we hear for the first time of a number of ranks in a formation. So it takes a while for them to figure out that this needs to be regulated and this needs to be organized. But once that happens, they seem to be going deeper and deeper. Basically, their formations keep getting deeper and deeper. So they start out, the first formation depths that we hear about are eight, but then already immediately afterwards, you hear about 25. Um, they seem to move up to 12, 16, 32. Sometimes we hear one very special case or a couple of very special cases where they're actually 50 deep. And apart from the fact that it's very hard to imagine how this would work when you're trying to get 50 men in a row to all simultaneously push in the same direction and maintain all that power, and the fact that, you know, obviously the men in the front ranks would be crushed to death without achieving very much. There's also the fact that the Greeks are actually themselves very explicit about why they're doing this. I mean, they're clearly trying to find a balance. And that balance is between width and depth, which is to say between vulnerability to add flanking, for which you need to be as wide as possible, and trying not to get broken through, for which you need to be deeper. And the idea for a, a bigger formation or a greater formation depth is that the rear ranks are simply going to be there in order to encourage the men in front and to scare the enemy. And it's all psychological. It's purely the presence of these men that means the men in front can't run away, but they also know their friends have their backs, so they don't have to worry about, you know, anybody getting through, um, anybody maybe, you know, trying to get at them from behind or from the flanks because there are men there trying to take care of that. And in front of them, their enemy knows if we want to break this formation, we have to kill enough of them that they lose heart. But there are so many of them, we'll probably have to plow through a lot of this unit before we actually get anywhere. So it has a, a sort of beneficial effect both to the men in the front ranks who are fighting and a detrimental effect to the morale of the enemy that are facing you. And that is precisely why the Greeks would deploy in very deep formations and why it was almost always successful to do so. So I, I, we'll talk a little bit about, we'll talk a lot about what's happening in the front ranks, but I, I kind of want to move on to our actual topic here, which is the Battle of the Mia. Um, and could you give us uh, a when when did this battle occur and what's the context of this battle? So the Battle of the Nemea took place in 394 and it was between basically Sparta and the remainder of its alliance and a large alliance of other Greek states who were trying to break Spartan power. Um, the situation here is that after the end of the Peloponnesian War, in which um, Sparta finally defeated Athens and dissolved the Athenian Empire, there was increasing dissent between Sparta and its former allies over the way in which they had concluded the war. Um, there were all sorts of things that people were unhappy about, and it was increasingly clear that Sparta had more or less just taken over the role that Athens had before and was now oppressing the Greeks where Athens had previously done it. So there was a lot of unhappiness about the way that the Spartans were running their new empire, and the Greeks were increasingly, or a lot of Greek cities were increasingly sort of trying to work out a way to resist them. 
And I mean, Xenophon alleges that there was actually Persian money involved in trying to encourage them to do so. Um, but the fact is that in 395, a number of great city-states, including the Argives, the Corinthians, the Boeotians, and the Athenians, joined together in an alliance against Sparta, which is, you know, one of the greater alliances that we ever see in the Greek world. And uh, apart after a couple of early campaigns, the early attempt of the alliance to try and deal with Sparta was basically to send as much of their army as possible into the Peloponnese and try to reach Sparta um, and basically get the first blow in and hopefully decide the war in one go. But while they were de deliberating over how they were supposed to do that, and of course the larger your alliance, the harder it is to try and figure out how you're supposed to approach this situation, the Spartans basically sort of tried to get ahead of them by sneaking past them, invading Corinthian territory, and forcing them to respond. So at this point you have the entire Spartan alliance, which is mainly consists of the Spartan army along with their Arcadian allies and a number of other Peloponnesian states, taking on the entire allied army, which is gathered at the river, at a small stream called the Nemea River. Yeah, and what, what size of armies are we talking about here? The Nemea is actually the largest hoplite battle in history. It is surprisingly huge in terms of the numbers that are usually called up. The numbers are not entirely clear from Xenophon, but other later sources supply some additional information which makes more sense. And it seems that the allied army had uh, gathered as many as 24,000 hoplites, and the Spartans uh, over against them had 23,000. So we're talking about a grand total of, of 47,000 hoplites taking the field together. And there's probably no occasion in Greek history when there were more hoplites in a single, involved in a single battle, unless we accept Herodotus' figures for Plataea, um, which suggests that there were as many as 50,000 fighting on the Persian side. But this is, this is probably exaggerated. So we're talking about literally the largest number of hoplites that are ever seen in a single place. And so what, what, what would an ordinary number of hoplites uh, look like then? Um, I mean, we have to consider that each of the single uh, contingents in these allied armies were bringing um, a couple thousand, and this is as much as their communities could usually sustain. So only the larger cities would have a larger number of hoplites. So for instance, in this battle, the Athenians would bring 6,000 men, the Corinthian or the Argives might bring 7,000 men. Um, but most of these city-states would only have a couple hundred because they were quite small, their communities were not very large. Medium-sized city-states might have 2,000, 3,000 hoplites at most. And in this army, in this battle particularly, the size is, is exploded by, purely by the fact that the alliances were so extensive and that they brought all their forces for this one battle. And, and do we have, you know, accompanying units of cavalry and archers and slingers? Absolutely. No hoplite army ever uh, went into battle without support troops. This is really one of the ways in which traditional views of what Greek warfare was like was skewed our perception. I mean, hoplites are never alone because if they are alone, they get their shit ruined. So the Spartans had brought several specialist light arm troops, 400 slingers from their allies in Elis and 300 archers, as well as a force of 700 cavalry. And the allies actually had an unnumbered um, large contingent, presumably, of light arm troops and a force composed of more than 1,500 cavalry. Okay, so we have basically, you know, 20, 20 to 24,000 hoplites on either side with um, several hundred to a couple thousand uh, other troops uh, kind of helping to protect the hoplites in a way that's right yeah yeah so they meet uh at this 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 river this stream uh nemea um, and what is it that that made this place of meeting for the battle or why this area in particular so like i said the spartans were trying to get through basically beyond the where the place where the allies were gathering and try to threaten some of their actual assets which is to say in this case the city of corinth and later on, this turned out to be the most strategic site of the war generally, which is why the war that the Allies fought against Sparta is known as the Corinthian War. So the idea is that Corinth being on the sort of key location in terms of it being on the neck between mainland Greece and the Peloponnese, and having control over that particular city means that you have control over where you can send your armies and where you might campaign freely. So Corinth is the key city here, and Sparta is trying to invade its territory and possibly, if there is a chance, seize the city and the Allies have to march out to prevent it. And so they march out to a large area of open plain um, where both sides have space to encamp, which they usually do actually on hills in places that are, that are easily defended. Um, and then they find a ground that is suitable to deploy an army of you know 24,000 hoplites simply because that takes up a lot of space. Yeah, so go ahead and take us to you know the day of the battle uh, and give us an idea that if we were kind of hovering over the field or looking at it from, you know, top a hill with a good view. I mean, what would we be seeing? 
Um, so you're seeing the, the two armies deploying against each other. And for a long time, actually, they weren't sure which side was going to make the first move. So probably for several days, they were camped out over against each other, waiting for the other person to deploy for battle. And the reason for this was that among the allies, they had agreed that each of the cities would, re- would lead the alliance for one day. Um, and the Boeotians, who were one of the aligned, uh, the allied uh, units, kept refusing to go to battle until they were the ones leading the alliance and they got to be on the right-hand side and to choose their deployment. Um, when that happened, basically both armies are sort of deploying all their hoplites in a long line um, that is meant to be unbroken, which is the, the key point of these phalanxes. They're trying to prevent having any kind of weakness against the attacks of enemy cavalry, infantry, or missile troops. So they b- build up an unbroken line that stretches for miles and miles across the battlefield in the case of the size of these armies. And they are basically trying to form up their their infantry with the cavalry, presumably on the flanks. We don't actually hear where they go, in order to try and and anticipate enemy deployments. Try and figure out a plan on how they're going to uh, how they're going to beat their opponents. Now, you had mentioned that the the Boeotians were trying to wait until they were the ones on the right hand side. What's the significance of that? So um, the right hand side, because of a particular mechanism in the way that hoplite warfare or hoplite combat works, the right-hand side often have the advantage, which is to say that, as Thucydides describes this to us, when a phalanx advances, every man drifts to the right because he's trying to protect his own right-hand side from attacks by swinging out his left side and holding a shield in front of him. And if every man does that as they advance, then the entire phalanx is slowly going to creep to the right, even when it's trying to move straight forward. And what this leads to is that when the two armies meet, even though they start out at the same point facing each other, they're going to end up partly overlapping on both right wings. So the right wing basically has the opportunity to then swing inward and start rolling up the enemy line. And because of this innate advantage in the right wing, this was often the place where the most important troops were stationed so that they could then um, decide the issue by retaining their cohesion, rolling up the enemy line and breaking the enemy. This is not, I mean, I should stress, this is not actually how all battles happened or this is not in any, in any sense a rule or a moral imperative. It is entirely due to the tactical expediency of having good troops on the side that was going to have tactical, tactical flexibility. But if there was a different plan by which the Greeks meant to win the battle, then they would put their best troops there, which was sometimes in the center, sometimes on the left wing. Yeah, because you know the, the Battle of Leuctra is, of course, the uh, the Spartans had all their troops stationed on the right side, and then you know their opponents said, well, we'll just move our best troops to the left side, and then we'll, we'll mirror you that way. Yeah, exactly, which was a very, very common and old expedient in Greek warfare. The first time we actually see that is in the Battle of Salamis, the naval battle in 480, which is you know more than a century before Leuctra. Um, where we, the, the Greeks notice that the Persians are putting their best sailors on the, on the right wing, and so the Greeks are putting the Athenians over against them, thinking that the Athenians are the only ones who are likely to beat them. And so the idea is that it doesn't matter which side you're on in a battle, it only matters where you need to be in order to win. And in many cases, this actually meant that the best troops were not on the right wing, but were on the left or in the center, if, they were, if that meant that they were over against the enemy's strongest troops, the ones that you had to counter, the ones you had to defeat. But in this particular case, because the two armies were so mixed and such a large coalition force, the plan had to be quite simple, the plan had to, plan had to be straightforward. And so in both cases, actually, um, for both sides, the plan ended up being, we're just going to go around the right-hand side. <laughs> Let's keep it simple. Well, very much so, because, I mean, these armies were almost uncontrollable, especially with the sheer numbers involved, but also because the contingents were not sort of under a very centralized command or anything like that. They were literally just in the same boat, like they were joined for the same cause, they were fighting for the same cause, but in many ways they were essentially uh, autonomous and they had to be given very simple orders in order to be relied upon to play their part. And, you know, I guess then when we actually do have the formation of this this phalanx, you know, front line, this line of, of all these units that we would have in that long stretched out line, we would have, you know, the, the Athenians here, the Corinthians here, the Argives here, uh, kind of grouped together by city state. That's right. Yeah. So the contingents are nicely listed in a lot of battles, like just moving from one flank to the other, just saying these troops are here, these troops are there. Um in this occasion, uh, when the Boeotians decided to fight, they were on the right wing. Um, in between, you had contingents of all the other states, the Corinthians next to them, and all the, all the others fleshing out the center of the phalanx. And then all the way at the left wing were the Athenians, who actually had the largest or the second largest contingent um, present at the battle with 6,000 hoplites of their own. 
So, I mean, so in a sense, you kind of have, you know, the, the, the you kind of have this reversal where you have the largest contingent over on the, the left wing. Yes. Well, it's the second largest. I mean, the Argives were, were slightly larger yet, but this is quite true. Like they, they should have presumably led from the right if they were, if we measured them purely on the sheer importance of the contingent. They were one of the leading factions of the alliance. They had more hoplites in the battle. So yeah, they should have been on the right if there was a consideration of honor involved. But actually it was literally just they were rotating the position on the right based on who was leading at the time um, in an attempt to stick to the same plan so that there could be no confusion about what each contingent was supposed to be doing. Now, we're, we're fighting here with the Spartans uh, is in this battle. And of course, everyone knows that the Spartans are the greatest troops ever to exist in history, right? <laughs> Absolutely. No, the Spartans, um, the Spartans obviously have a great big tradition about them, that they were the best troops ever and that they were fantastic war machines and that they trained their entire lives for nothing but war and that they were perfect warriors. This is all extremely exaggerated and it has very little to do with historical reality. What we're actually seeing is that as these Greek cities, when we were talking earlier about the Archaic period, when Greek cities would develop greater communities that are capable of fighting as heavy infantry or cavalry, and they're trying to find ways to deal with that. What the Spartans did when this happened to them, sort of in the middle of the 6th century, is they reorganized their society in a way that was intended actually entirely to prevent factional strife and civil war, to make sure that nobody could or nobody wanted to try and come out on top in this society. So they were just trying to equalize everyone in order to make it so that no one would try and want more, try and claim absolute power, try and um, strive to outdo their rivals in a sort of ongoing um, aristocratic factional political game. And the way they did that was to try and enforce an egalitarianism and to demand or to declare that every single person who was in the citizen body had to devote their entire lives not to trying to, you know, come out on top in this internal competition, but to try and be the best at representing Lacedaemonian or Spartan interests abroad. In other words, becoming better warriors so that they could beat the other Greeks. Now, what they still had, I mean, this meant that they had no army, they had no military, just like any of the other Greeks. They had no military organization that was formal, no barracks, no institution, no academy, nothing like that. What they did have was a militia, just like everybody else, but unlike the others, they had some preparation for battle. They had trained, they had been exercising a lot, they had devoted a lot of time to try and figure out how best to do this. So they had a militia, just like everyone else. It was not in any sense more professional than anyone else, but it was better prepared for what it was supposed to do. They had at least gone through some training. Yeah, which, I mean, this is a crucial point. Like, it is very much the, the, the adage that, you know, in the, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Like, they had received some training, and it's very, very limited. The training that the Spartans went through is described to us by Xenophon in the 4th century. Um, it's very, very simple. They do some formation evolutions, but for the most part, their training consists of fitness and obedience. Those are the things that they're trained to, trained to have as Spartan warriors. Um, so it's not a practical, applied military science. It is just an ability to face the dangers and to face the hardships and to face the challenges of battle better than an ordinary citizen. The other city-states had no training whatsoever. And that was the big difference. So the Spartans had basic, some basic training, but the other states had none. And that made, gave the Spartans a huge advantage when it came to um, actual fighting, cl close combat, as well as tactical control in battle. Well, let's, let's get into the actual combat then. So. Uh, we have these very long and deep lines of, of uh, phalanxes. Uh, we have uh, archers and cavalry uh, off to the off to the wings, uh, and they come together and they clash. So, are we are we seeing these two phalanxes, you know, rushing towards each other? Is this a slow march? What happens when they meet? So uh, normally they march at each other until they get into reasonable range and then they start running. But at this battle, the Spartans are trying to do something new, which we haven't actually seen them done before in this sort of planned and measured way, which is that they're telling their entire army to lead off to the right so that they can go and encircle the enemy. So this is a very clear tactical plan. The Spartans are playing with this template of, oh, we're just going to go at them and swoop around the right. Um, they're saying, we're going to not just swoop around the right, we're going to fold our entire army around them. So they're leading off their entire phalanx to the right in column, ordering all of their allies to follow along. And these allies presumably have been trained to do this because no other Greek force would be able to um, maneuver in such a way. Um, and then at a point when they reach the desired you know, extension to the right, um, they sacrifice a goat and they lead the charge. 
But of course, for other Greeks, charging is very much the way to overcome fear and the way to come to grips with the enemy before you really start to realize what you're doing and what you're facing, what you're up against. So for the Spartans, they were the exception because they had been so drilled and disciplined that they actually saw the disadvantage of charging into battle, losing your cohesion, and had the nerve to advance marching in step to the sound of flute players who accompanied them into battle. And this was a particularly unnerving sight for the others who thought, like, what kind of superhuman beings are these that they can face battle without having to charge and scream like we do? So it seems like the Spartans were kind of deliberately exaggerating that rightward drift in order to get kind of a flanking position. Um, But also they were doing it very deliberately, even stopping to sacrifice a goat. Um, (laughs) No, absolutely. A lot of this was, was clearly premeditated. They had a clear plan of, okay, so we know how these battles normally go. We're just going to try and take advantage of that in order to win with least possible risk to ourselves. But you do have to realize, of course, that as they lead off to the right, the enemy further and further overlaps their own left flank. And they're perfectly happy with that left flank being butchered. They just sacrifice it. So the Spartans are trying to preserve their own contingent on the extreme right of their line by sacrificing the left. And they're just like, we can handle that. We don't care. So it's kind of like, you know, you'd have these two kind of misaligned uh, lines of phalanxes coming together and then just wrapping the the right flank of each, wrapping up the left flank of the other is is kind of a phalanx Ouroboros. (laughs) It is to some extent, yeah. I mean, on the, on the one side, on the side of the Boeotians, it would presumably have been a mess as they all saw that no one was over against them and they just more or less turned left and fell upon the enemy in a heap. Whereas for the Spartans, this was actually a very developed sort of wheeling maneuver in which they moved the column around a pivot and moved it straight up to form, as, the, as Xenophon calls it, like a gamma, so like a sort of straight angle, L-shaped phalanx, which would then simply march forward and roll up the enemy line as a, as a steamroller. Yeah, so essentially the Spartans were, were betting on the fact that they could roll up that enemy's left flank faster than the enemy could roll up their left flank. Yeah, or they could. They were counting mainly on their experience in the Battle of Mantinea, which had happened some 20 years earlier, in which the same thing had happened. Like Both left flanks uh, or had been completely overwhelmed. But at that point, the Spartans' enemies were unable to recover from that and reorganize and get back into formation. They were simply charging and flush with victory and running about killing people. Whereas the Spartans were able to say, look, we're not going to pursue. We're just going to turn. We're going to wheel to the left and we're going to charge into those guys who are over there celebrating their victory. And their greater control and their ability to manage large numbers of troops allowed them to basically take on and, you know, instantly scare away and, and defeat um, the scattered remains of the victorious enemy on the other flank. So bring us to the actual clash of hoplites then. What happens when these two, these two lines meet? Um, so at the Nemea what happens is that the two sides crash into each other. We don't quite know what this looks like in detail, but it seems that in this case, as in many other battles, a lot of it would have been over very quickly. One side or the other lost their nerve almost instantly. And in this case, all of Sparta's allies ran away almost immediately. And this is primarily probably because they were not too keen to fight for Sparta in this. I mean, nobody was very happy with Spartan domination except the Spartans themselves. So they were perfectly happy to say, like, to put in a minimal effort uh, fighting on the side of the Spartans in this battle. So um, the, the various allies more or less break instantly. There is one exception to this, which is the particular men of a particular small town are actually fighting to the death against some of the Boeotians, which is noted in, in Xenophon, like, oh, they, they all fell where they stood. Um, so there's, there's hard fighting on some parts of the line, but the rest of it is actually a very short clash after which one, the side that has the lower morale simply makes a break for it. So, I mean, this hard fighting, what does it look like? You know, because we had talked a little bit about, you know, how there's maybe kind of an orthodox and, you know, kind of a heretical... Uh, view of what happens when two lines of phalanxes meet each other you know is it this kind of classical idea of the push you know shields pushing against shields um, or do we see it, it more kind of open and less pushing more stabbing yeah so the traditional view has been that it's actually like if there is a side that resists then what what results is an actual literal shoving match um, that the two sides would push into each other until one of the other gave way um, but this is very tenuous. There is really no evidence for this except for the use of the word pushing in various battle descriptions. Um, it seems much more likely, considering you know that these are humans who don't want to die and don't want to see themselves crushed to oblivion by the men behind them, that what would actually happen 
is what's called the sort of pulse theory of battle, which is to say that the units would clash into each other. Perhaps in the charge, they would actually literally barge into each other and try to stab whatever they saw. Um, but that if one, if neither side actually broke, that they would more or less pull apart again um, for a breather, at which point the battle would actually erupt much more sort of um, casually or here and there um, in sort of moments of rushing, a couple of guys rushing forward or a group rushing forward or a few files rushing forward um, to try and get a couple of blows in and then retreating again, pulling out the wounded, trying to catch their breath, maybe get, get, even getting a drink if they could, getting their servants to mop their brows, trying to make sure that they would not get too exhausted and that their line would hold. If the fighting was particularly severe, it may well be possible that there was a crush in the sense that the men guts were constantly trying to move forward as a body in order to overthrow the enemy, at which point there may have been some actual physical shoving or pushing or crushing, um, but those would have been local and temporary uh, with the intention simply of seeing whose nerve would break first. So we have the left flank of the Spartans just absolutely collapsing almost immediately. Um, what's happening on the left flank of these you know, uh, allied units then? So at the left flank of the allied units, the Athenians are trying to face the Spartans, but they realize that almost two thirds of, um, of the enemy force is actually in their flank rather than in front of them. So they fight for a bit, but they run away. But then it's a very long way to run before they're out of range of that L-shaped formation. So they get absolutely massacred. On the other hand, there is a part of the Athenian army that is actually not facing the Spartans because they're further off to the right and they get away almost completely unscathed. They beat the opponents that are over against them, they chase them for a bit, and then they turn around to try and make it back to their own camp. But by the time the Spartans start moving across the battlefield, basically advancing against these Athenians that they're encircling, by the time they move past, the Athenians aren't back yet, so they basically escape unharmed. They move behind the Spartans and just sort of move on back towards their base. I mean, so it sounds like the, the Spartans' plan is working pretty well. It's working extremely well. I mean, they just sort of mopped up 4,000 Athenian hoplites with almost no loss to themselves. I mean, there, there's a later report that says that only eight Spartans died in this battle. So there's, there's basically no casualties and a complete victory on the left wing, on the right wing for the Spartans. I mean. Yeah, so we, we basically have the left wing of both armies totally collapsing, giving us a, that, you know, that uh, hoplite or a Boros, where they're both eating each other's tail. Um, so what... You know how how does this how does this play out? How does this you know go forward? Do they just kind of loop around each other and end up facing each other from other sides? Um, this only happens once actually. There is a, a later battle in this same year in three nine four where this happens, but at the Nemea this is not what actually happens. Um, each of the victorious units starts chasing the enemies that they've beaten. That is to say, each of those allies, the Boeotians, the Corinthians, the Argives, are all chasing the enemies that they've just wiped out, that they've just routed. Um, after a while of chasing them, they stop the chase because they're exhausted, you know, they're heavy, heavily armored infantry, they can't run very far, so they stop and they turn back and they start moving back towards their base in order to go through the ritual of clearing out the dead, setting up a trophy, all that stuff. So they think they've won, right? They think the battle's over. They, they won in their local part of the battlefield. The battlefield's very large. They probably have no idea what's going on elsewhere. So they think, you know, job well done, let's go home. Uh, the Spartans are beaten. But at that point, the Spartans, who have moved their formation at right angle to the original lines of the phalanxes, they are still moving across the battlefield. They're simply marching forward and encountering one contingent after the other as it returns from the chase. And as they do so, they crash into the flank and wipe them out one after the other. So it sounds like this is a pretty smashing victory for Sparta. Absolutely. It's a, it's a crushing victory. The cost is very, very high. A later source tells us, and these numbers are generally accepted, that the Spartans, because the Allies were beaten, the Alliance actually suffered something like 1,100 casualties. But the dead among the Allies, the enemies of Sparta, is closer to 3,000. So it's, it's a massacre. I mean, so do, does this, when the significance for this larger Corinthian war is, of course, uh, it, it sounds like that Sparta has the advantage. Uh, I mean, is, is this a crushing blow right at the start? Um, it was originally probably intended to be a decisive blow. The Allies trying to gather in the Peloponnese to try and see if they could knock out Sparta in one go. So there were a lot of really dramatic gestures in the early years of this war in attempts to try and really break the Spartans and try to make sure that they can, not, they can no longer resist. Um, but all of those blows really fail. So the Nemea fails um, or it ends in defeat for the Allies. And then there is another battle later in the year at Cornea. Um, against another Spartan army, which also ends in Spartan victory, so that the Allies can't really, they can't really manage to beat Sparta in open battle. 
And at that point, really, the war descends into a much more sort of dragged out positional warfare where they stage, they um, place a garrison in Corinth and try to hold the city against Spartan incursions, whereas the Spartans occupy the port of Corinth and basically just raid the territory and try to bring Corinth over to their side. And whichever side Corinth leans then becomes the decisive tipping point for the war. Yeah, so it kind of, you know, uh, the Corinth is behind its walls. Uh, the Spartans are out in the field trying to kind of compel them to say, hey, well, we're going to keep burning your farms until you either uh, capitulate or you come out and fight us and we win again. That's more or less true. But I mean, the this Corinthians at this point have support from their allies as well. They have uh, f- uh, foreign garrisons in their city constantly. And that foreign garrison is basically on watch to take any opportunity they can to fight. When the Spartans first infiltrate the Corinthian harbor, there is actually another battle, which the allies also lose. Um, but then after that, there is more positional warfare going on in which the Spartans are trying to break the will of Corinth. But Argos is very much on the ball there. So Argos has troops in Corinth to prevent that from happening. And the Athenians have troops in Corinth to prevent that from happening. And meanwhile, those troops are also able to raid and attack the allies of Sparta in the area. So they're very much trying to go blow for blow um, in an attempt to see whose nerve breaks first. And this, uh, this is not entirely to do with nerves so much as with monetary reserves. Um, Because the war is not only being fought in terms of having troops permanently in the field, which is costly, but it's also being fought elsewhere by large fleets, which are extremely costly. And that is very much a war that Sparta is losing. Yeah, so at some point I would like to have you maybe come back and we can talk about, you know, ancient and classical Greek uh, siege warfare or lack thereof or whatever techniques may be. But to put that aside for right now, um, I want to get back to the kind of, you know, we talked about the significance of this battle um, for the Corinthian War, then, so it, it was supposed to be this knockout blow, but it ended up just kind of, um, kind of descending into this, as you put, positional warfare. But what is the significance of Nemea when it comes down to hoplite warfare in general? I mean, do people at, at the time, I guess you could say, and this is, I guess, difficult based on our sources, but I mean, do we have people saying maybe we should start to look into more uh, kind of tactical flexibility with hoplites? The interesting thing about the Nemea is that it is, I mean, scholars have approved, has, have sort of, um, judged this battle very differently. I mean, there, are, there are actually people who say that this is the last of the old fashioned hoplite battles. And after this, battles become much more sophisticated. But then there are others who actually argue that the Nemea is what, what one scholar called the first battle won by tactics because the Spartans obviously had this very deliberate plan in order to win and they were carrying it out by way of maneuver rather than by simply moving forward. Um, so it seems from these different uh, like appraisals that it's, it's almost as if the Nemea is on the tipping point somewhere between the old style of warfare and the new. But what's actually going on is this is the early 4th century and Greek warfare is still in the, at this time slowly developing from this very crude, very poorly organized and very sort of ad hoc warfare of the archaic period towards a more organized and professional form of warfare. And they're really lumbering towards professional warfare one step at a time. And so what we're seeing at the Nemea is we see very large forces brought together. We see them operating to some extent tactically. Um, We see both sides being very aware of tactical advantages. The Thebans are deploying in deep formation. The Athenians are aware they're going uh, going to be surrounded if they follow along with this plan. So there's all sorts of tactical deliberations going on. Um, there are large contingents of professional light troops and a very, very large amount of cavalry present. So you see them working out different ways to use combined armed tactics, to use their hoplites to the best of their ability, to prevent the vulnerabilities of their militia. So there's all sorts of things going on that basically course throughout the classical period that have started in the early 5th century and that will continue on all the way down into the 3rd century, at which point, of course, um, there is... A, a complete paradigm shift at the time when when Macedon comes to the fore. Yeah, there's a slightly pivotal moment uh, or a pivotal man who we sometimes call Alexander the Medio. That one guy, yeah. Who cares? Yeah, that one guy. Um, no, but this is very important. I mean, the, the classical warfare is very much, as I said, it's in the middle of a transition from crude militia ad hoc warfare to a more professional form, and the Nemea is to some extent a sign of the perfection of the kind of battle that they had at the time. After which it would continue to develop further along two lines, which are basically both about professionalization. One of them is the increasing use of mercenaries, which are simply more capable than your untrained citizen militia. And the other is the increasing establishment of standing forces that are based, that can be trained and prepared in the same way that the Spartans are. 
And both of those are attempts to try and increase the tactical control of generals and the ability and, the vulner- and to reduce the vulnerability of the hoplite militia that are performing all these battles and wars because that hoplite militia is your citizen body and you want to be careful with it, but you can't really do very much with it to protect it against its, its tactical weaknesses. It's going to kind of bring us to uh, a bit of an epilogue then. Uh, yeah. And where I kind of just want to ask you the fact that I mean, this seems like a very significant battle. It seems like it has, uh, at least among classicists, uh, a kind of certain cachet about the importance of it, whether it's the, whether it's the end of one style of warfare and the beginning of another, or whether it's kind of the idealization of one style of warfare. Um, but at the same point, I had, you know, I am not a classicist, but I, I tend to think myself as pretty well versed in history. And um, as someone you know who grew up in the American uh, historical education system, we learn a lot of Greek history. But I had never even heard of this battle. So, I mean, why, why is this battle so significant to classicists, but not to, uh, you know, popular culture then? Well, the thing about Greek battles is that we actually have detailed accounts for very few of them. So we're always working with very few examples of what's actually going on and trying to extrapolate that and say, these are the, these, this is the level of tactical sophistication of the Greeks. This is the level of their tactical abilities. This is the, the way in which they fought their battles. Um, And it's very hard to find anything that is really universal. And one of the things about the Battle of the Nemea is perhaps it is not typical in the sense that its course features a lot of different things that are unique to it, a lot of different things that are really exciting because they're rarely seen or because they're un, uh, un, because we don't quite understand what's going on. Um, but it is the biggest of the battles that the Greeks fought against each other throughout this classical period. It's this massive engagement between these enormous militia armies and actually, perhaps the most interesting thing about it is that even though its outcome was very, very clear, it was so indecisive. This still didn't decide the war in any way. Neither side was in any sense feeling that they had lost the war in that particular, on that particular day, despite the fact that they brought all their forces to bear on the Spartans and they had been completely wiped out. So there is a very strong sense that this uh, is almost exemplary of the futility of um, of these grand hoplite battles, even in their spectacle. And so I guess the, the fact that there wasn't decisive, and I, I think there is an idea of, at least in that kind of idealized version of Greek warfare, that battles are decisive, um, but also the fact that it's, it's, not, it's not a marathon, it's not a uh, uh, Salamis, it's, it's not something that ended a, you know, a war or was very decisive in that. It was, it was almost inconse- inconsequential. Well, precisely. I mean, this is definitely the reason why you won't learn about it in school, about the Nemea, because there's just nothing that changed one way or the other because of it. You know, you learn about a battle like, like Plataea or Marathon or Salamis. You learn about a battle like Lutra, perhaps, because these are moments in which great political powers were brought to their knees, in which sort of great dramatic things happen. Um, the Nemea is one of those battles in which everything was brought in, everything was put on, uh, was, was put at stake. Um, for really very little gain. And in that sense, it's much more important to me as a, as a historian of tactics and tactical thought than it is to anybody studying the great movements of polit- political, scientific, and social uh, history of, of, of classical Greece. Well, Rule, I want to thank you for speaking to us on the Ask Historians podcast today. It's my great pleasure. Thank you very much. And as always, thank you all for listening and a very special thanks to our Patreon supporters for making it possible not only for the podcast to continue on as we do, but also for making it possible for us to finally pay dividends back to you. So uh, I'm very happy that with your support and with the increasing numbers of you who are supporting us that we can kind of, I mean, I know that some podcasts and some you know Patreon accounts, if you support them, they'll give you you know things like buttons and stickers and such like that. But we're the Ask Historians podcast, so we're very very happy to pay dividends back to our supporters in the form of academic textbooks, because that's kind of how we roll. And hopefully, we'll have a chance uh, with your support to do that increasingly more often. Um, in the next episode, I will actually have some sort of budgeting out where we can kind of tell how often we should be doing this. I originally planned to do this like every four months uh, on the basis of kind of my rough estimates about how much it would cost to buy the books and do the shipping. Um, But uh, the books are turning out to be with the very, with the the avalanche of suggestions I got from our flared users. uh, They've given me a number of just almost, I mean, a whole lot of, of books that are in, very affordable, but also very informative. So, which is the best kind of books, uh, both affordable and informative. 
So hopefully we will do this actually a lot more frequently than I had originally planned. Uh, so that, if you see four months on the Patreon account, um, expect that to change very rapidly. But I hope today's episode helped illuminate a lot of things about uh, ancient Greece in general uh, and ancient Greek warfare as well. I just want to call back to the fact that um, our <laughs> our guest today has a PhD in ancient Greek warfare and tactics. And he cites this kind of an inspiration for what got him into it <laughs> was uh, Total War, the video game. And I know I've heard this from so many other people that when it comes down to it, they say, well, I you know, I was playing a video game or I was reading a book or I'd seen a movie with these kind of like, you know, pop culture sources, which engage you and then lead to this, leads you down this twisting path. And next thing you know, you're, you're, you have a doctorate in ancient Greek warfare tactics and, you know, strategy. Other things you can learn will be coming up in two weeks. We will be talking about uh, health and hygiene in the 19th century, uh, mostly 19th century America, but also some about Britain as well. So we're talking about kind of undergarments and hair care and soaps uh it's i mean it's probably uh if it was if we had smell vision it would be the nicest smelling episode i'm sure or perhaps the worst smelling episode is hard to say uh, and after that we're gonna be sticking in the 19th century area and we'll be uh, talking about milling and baking in the 19th century and that'll actually be a two-part episode because apparently there is we're gonna hit a whole lot of connections it is uh probably the episode i came into not really expecting, not really knowing what to get out of it, but uh, definitely it, it ended up being uh, these these pair of episodes on milling and baking that we're going to get into. Definitely one of the episodes or pair of episodes, I should say, that really just blew my mind and how much and how connected uh, these things were. I mean, I guess you, you could say, I mean, it's bread, what we're talking about. Uh, it's kind of a, you might even say it's a stable food. But uh, so I hope uh, you will come by in two weeks and learn how to get clean in the 19th century. And then uh, two weeks after that, uh, come by and start on a long journey on learning how to eat in the 19th century. Uh, until then, feel free to rate and review us on iTunes, uh, or we are now, as I mentioned, we are now on Google Play. I don't know how Google Play is rating and reviewing system works quite yet because we're still pretty new on there but i do know that if you rate and review us on itunes especially if you write a message we bump back into like the top of the suggestion queue so please uh, the more you actually you know leave a short comment the the more people see this and the more people you can talk to about ancient greek warfare and hygiene and baking and all the other <laughs> crazy bizarre topics we've covered on the podcast we're available on innumerable streaming services uh so if you think we're not available on whatever streaming service you want to use you're probably wrong. We're probably on there. Uh, Spotify has recently started carrying podcasts, uh, especially through Libsyn, which is our uh, our hosting service. Uh, although they're mostly, they're kind of curating uh, podcasts. I put in a, a request to be added to their podcast list, but they're mostly looking for kind of like um, new pop culture technology focused things, which are, I guess, not really what we do. So I don't know if we're going to end up there, but in the meantime, again, we're available on any number of outlets. So uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you in two weeks. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians Podcast.